If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we may gather in your presence this morning and rejoice in your great work of salvation. We do pray that you would strengthen us by grace to trust in you and to follow after you throughout our days. We thank you for our time together this morning and pray for your blessing on us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Let's sing our opening hymn, and Rick will introduce that to us. We're singing, O Come All Ye Faithful, 208. <laughs> He suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there it will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Finally, the book of Philippians, chapter 4, reading verses 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our meditation on the Shorter Catechism takes a look at question number 95. We've been considering the sacraments, and today we uh, are continuing our look at the sacrament of baptism, the first of two sacraments given by Christ for this church. The question now before us is, to whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church till they profess their faith in Christ and obedience to Him. But the infants of such as are members of the visible church are to be baptized. The question of who should be baptized comes into consideration on a number of fronts. Um, certainly, we should just simply baptize people who wish to be a part of the church merely because they want to come into the church and be a part of things here. They need to make a public profession of faith. They need to confess faith in Jesus Christ. It needs to be a clear confession of faith and a resolution to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't just simply baptize people to expand our membership or to add to the church roles, but we baptize on the basis of a confession. We are a confessional church. And so that confession is vital to membership in Christ's church. Uh, so when the gospel goes out into the community and someone is uh, converted, comes to faith in Christ, then we uh, baptize them, uh, signifying that they are in union with Christ, they're in fellowship with Christ, and in fellowship with Christ's church. And so we welcome them into the fellowship of God's people through baptism. This is one reason why you should not delay baptism. Some make a profession of faith in Christ, but then put off baptism for some period of time. And uh, that, that is uh, actually disobedient to the Lord Jesus who commands us to be baptized. Uh, and secondly, it delays our fellowship within the life of the church and the full communion that should be ours through Christ. In fact, uh, you cannot receive the Lord's Supper until you've first been baptized. And so if you are to take part in the communion of the church, it must be, uh, first of all, through baptism. But then second, the, the consideration is given to the children of believing parents. In the course of history, in the life of the church, there have been two points of view with regard to this. Many actually, uh, in, in a more detailed look at it, but uh, two major points of view. One is that infant children should not be baptized until they are of age and are able to make a personal public profession of faith on their own. So there needs to be certain maturity within the life of the child so that the child understands the significance of a profession of faith in Christ and only at that point, having heard that profession of faith by the elders of the church, that child then is baptized. Uh, typically within that uh, framework, uh, the child will be baptized by immersion. Now, within uh, Reformed churches, uh, we recognize that the sign of the covenant is to be given to the children of believing parents. Uh, even in their infancy, even before they've made any profession of faith in Christ. In fact, infants are unable to make a verbal, credible profession of faith. And so the application of the sign of baptism is not with regard to their present profession of faith. It may have in view a future profession of faith, but uh, it's not required for baptism. What counts is the parent's faith and the fact that God considers their the family of a believing parent to be holy before the Lord. Now you can read about that in 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul talks about the relationship between husbands and wives where one partner in the marriage is a believer and the other is not. And Paul says that your spouse and your unbelieving spouse and your children are holy to the Lord. They enter into a covenant relationship with God in view of the faith of the 
believing parent. And so therefore they have certain blessings that accrue to them by virtue of the faith of the parent. It doesn't mean that they are necessarily saved or will be saved. Uh, but they, they do have certain blessings extended to them by virtue of the faith of the believing partner within the marriage. When you think about the children then of believing parents who are within this covenant relationship with God, having his blessings, receiving the word of God uh, in their life uh, through attendance at worship services, through the teaching of their uh, Christian parent as well, uh, through uh, the discipline of the church, as the church, and through its fellowship, through the ministry of the word, and perhaps even through uh, actions by the session, brings discipline to that child or that individual, then that too uh, leads them to faith in Christ. That's an indication that they are in a special relationship with God in a covenant relationship. I think what's difficult for those who are of a, a Baptist uh, point of view to understand about the application of the sign of the covenant to believing, or excuse me, to the infant children of believers is that they don't always see and understand the connection between the old covenant sign of union with Christ in circumcision and how it is fulfilled in the new covenant sign of baptism. And so in the old covenant, the sign of circumcision was obviously applied to infant baby boys and the girls were included as it were in the uh, circumcision of the boy and that child receives that sign of the covenant as a uh, a sign of his union with God. This is our God. Uh, and, and the child is in a covenant relationship with God. Abraham, the believing parent, uh, was to set aside his children and all who were within his household for circumcision. And so they entered into a covenant relationship with God. They were a part of what might be considered in that period of time the visible church. Now, the sign of the covenant in circumcision was a spiritual relationship. It was not really a national thing, not identifying people as particularly Jews, because there are other nations that also practice a, a form of circumcision as well. But this was a sign of the covenant, of a relationship with God. Now, it needed to come to a point in the life of that child that the child would grow and profess faith and serve the Lord. But nonetheless, the sign of the covenant under the old administration was given to an infant well before the child was able to make any credible profession of faith. In fact, there are exhortations by Moses and others for uh, adults to be circumcised in their hearts. In other words, they grew up having been circumcised in the flesh, but that a sign of the covenant was not evident in their hearts and in their lives. They had not appropriated the sign of the covenant for themselves. And so therefore, they were encouraged to have that inward work of God within the heart applied to them. And so this sign of the covenant comes into the new covenant, and the, the sign of circumcision took part in the Old Testament shadows and types. It was like the, the sacrifices in the temple. It was a bloody ritual. And it was something that pointed forward to what God would do for us in Christ in the future. With the coming of Christ, all those old covenant shadows and types, all that shedding of blood is put aside because the blood of Christ was shed once for all. And so now it's appropriate that the sign of the covenant of relationship with God enter into a new phase, that it be changed, that it would reflect the fulfillment of God's promises and the reality of Christ's presence. And so the sign of circumcision is replaced by baptism, water baptism. And so the, the sign signifies the washing away of our sins through the application of the water. Now, if the sign of the covenant was given to children in the old covenant period of time, before they were able to make any profession of faith, and we come into the New Testament and nothing is said to the effect that the sign of the covenant 
should no longer be given to the infant children of believing parents, but rather we see the sign of the covenant is to be extended to all who believe in Christ. And then we have examples in the book of Acts where the whole household was baptized. Think of the Philippian jailer when Paul and Silas baptized. He and his household received baptism. And this occurs time and time again. There's not a specific assertion that there were infant children in that household, but surely at some point there was, nor is there any actually indication that the children who might have been in the household also professed faith in Christ. It's just the faith of the Philippian jailer that's noted, then the rest of the family is baptized along with the jailer, signifying Christ's ownership and Christ's dominion over that family. So, the sign of the covenant comes into the New Testament Every indication is that that sign should continue being applied to the infant children of believers. After all, the new covenant is a time of expanded blessings. The gospel goes out to all the nations of the earth. There is the, it is the time of fulfillment and blessing upon God's people. And so with the coming of Christ, you have a great expansion of the kingdom of God and glorious blessings that come upon the church that were not experienced up to the old covenant period of time. If that's the case, are we then to say that the infant children of believing parents are no longer eligible for the sign of the covenant? That they are to be excluded from the blessings of that covenant relationship? That would go against the whole progress of redemptive history and the fulfillment of the old covenant types and shadows in Christ and in this new age in which we now live. And so our catechism and reformers in general have asserted that the infants of such as are members of the visible church are to be baptized. It doesn't save them by the application of the sign of the covenant. It doesn't mean necessarily that they will be saved at some future point in life. It simply says that, that they are in a unique relationship with God. He is their covenant Lord. They are within his household and they are Heirs of the blessings of the new covenant, even as a, a Jewish a child was heir of the blessings of the old covenant, the promises of the covenants, as Paul talks about, I think it's in Romans chapter 9, first few verses there. The, the Jewish child had all kinds of blessings accrued to it because it was raised within a Jewish family. So likewise, and even more so, a child within the a Christian family should be baptized and it will enjoy many extended blessings that are not eligible to the children of pagans out in the world who do not confess faith in Christ. So parents, perhaps even grandparents, encourage your uh, children uh, to bring their children uh, to uh, the Lord for baptism. Let's take a moment then to pray and bring our request to the Lord at this time. We'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word and pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts. We pray that you would help us to grow in faith, to understand your will and your ways more perfectly. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing on that. We pray for uh, your blessing on First Church. We pray that you would encourage us to grow in grace and to follow after Christ more fully, to imitate him and indeed to uh, be more and more like him with each day. We thank you, Lord, for our fellowship and pray that your blessing will be on our church, those who are here especially. We thank you for uh, their faithfulness before you, their uh, fulfillment of their membership vows, their participation in the services, and their commitments to serving here and bringing others to faith in Christ. And we pray for others who are unable to attend. We pray, Lord, that your blessing will be on them, that you would encourage and comfort them from your word and build them up in their faith, bless them with fellowship and growth and grace. And we pray for those who may be wandering from your word, from your will in their lives. We pray that you would uh, bring them back to yourself, bring them back to faithfulness before you, and pray, Lord, that you help them to praise you for your goodness and love. We thank you, Lord, for your care and provision for uh, those who are part of our church and our extended families. We thank you for your kindness to Chrissy in watching over her in her surgery this week. 
We pray that as she recovers from that, that you would bring her continued healing and strength. We pray for your continued blessing on her and Mike. We pray, Lord, that you would lead them to faith in Christ and trusting in Him for everything. And we pray, Lord, for your uh, great work uh, in their lives. We uh, do pray for Rhoda and Emmanuel as they settle into their new home. We thank you for watching over them in this move. Uh, it's such a daunting task at uh, a late stage of life to make such a move. We thank you, Lord, that it all has gone well. And we do pray for your blessing on them in their new uh, home. We thank you for their son and his hospitality and taking care of Rhoda and Emmanuel. And pray, Lord, for him and his family that you would provide for them. Father, well, we thank you for watching over George McLaren as he had a significant fall this week. We pray that you bring healing to him. Pray that you would relieve him of the pain that he's experiencing and grant him greater freedom of movement. We pray, Lord, that you protect him from falls and we pray that you would preserve him spiritually in your hands. We pray, Lord, that you would work your grace and love in his heart and in his life. Help him to grow in his knowledge of you, and we pray, Lord, that you bring him safely and securely in Christ into his eternal kingdom. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with uh, others in our church family. We thank of Pat and pray that you would bless her, minister her, to her spiritual needs uh, through your word. We thank you for the times that she and Mike are able to read from the Psalms, and we pray, Lord, that your spirit would bless these times to her heart. May she see how the Psalms point to Jesus and to his sufferings on our behalf. Help her, O oh Lord, to be encouraged to call upon you, knowing that you are her sovereign Lord and that you control all things. And we pray, Lord, for uh, your work of grace in her heart that she would have hope, trusting in Christ, and looking for the great salvation that is ours in Christ. We pray for your blessing on her. We pray that you would be with uh, Ryan, as he looks for opportunities to serve, we thank you for the possibility of work uh, at uh, the, the Care and Share Center nearby. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless him uh, if he is uh, able to uh, take part in that. pray that you would encourage him and uh, develop within him the skills that he needs to be able to work for himself and to provide for himself. We thank you for your love and your grace evident in his life. We pray that you continue to care for him and uphold him by your word. Father, we thank you for uh, our time of uh, celebration as we rejoice in the coming of our Savior and this special time of year. We pray that as we reflect on your goodness to us, help us to uh, speak to others about the great gift that you've given to us through Christ, the gift of eternal life of salvation that is complete. We pray, Lord, that your blessing will be on our witness. We pray, Lord, that you would add to your, our numbers those that should be saved. Father, we thank you for uh, our, your mercies to us and ask that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is 201, A Little Town of Bethlehem. 201, A Little Town of Bethlehem. Should we stand?
Exodus chapter 16. So pick up our reading in verse 22. Just to remind you, the Israelites wandered out into the wilderness and were without food. And they grew very upset. The grumbling on the part of the Israelites was widespread throughout the whole congregation. Uh, and they came and they were ready for anyone who represented God. So Moses and Aaron uh, were the objects of their grumbling. But God heard their grumbling, and rather than disciplining them, rather than punishing them for their sinfulness, for the outrageous things they were saying in view of their frustration and anger, uh, God instead shows His grace. And one can think of how Moses and Aaron instructed Israel to go look into the wilderness and see the glory of the Lord. Later on, Moses himself will ask that God would show him his glory. And uh, the, the Lord would appear before him and show that he was a God who was loving, compassionate, and gracious. Here is one example of that where he provides his people with food. He provides them with quail in the evening and manna every morning. So every morning people of Israel would go out into the wilderness area gather what had fallen through the night and bring it together. There was enough for each day once a day for each person meeting their full needs. I'm tempted to continue preaching in that older section but we need to move on. Looking at verse 22 then, we continue the narrative. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink. There were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, so that they may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate the manna forty years, so they came to a, to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is the tenth part of an ephah. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for the gracious provision you make for us, for our growth in grace and for our knowledge of Christ. We pray that you would bless our meditation on your word this morning. May your spirit prepare our hearts to receive your word 
And we pray that you grant us grace to know you and follow you more fully, more perfectly, uh, to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I opened up my edition of First Things Magazine and read an article by a Jewish professor by the name of Shalom Karmi. He's a professor at Yeshiva University, which is in Israel, I think Tel Aviv, but I'm not certain of that. At any rate, he's a philosopher. And he writes about the uh, struggle that he, he has as a Jew and as a philosopher to reconcile the command to believe on the part of the Jewish faith and the skepticism required of a philosopher to doubt and question everything. He thinks about his history and philosophy and how Socrates was one who questioned everything, so much so that the Athenians grew weary of his questioning and decided to give him a little bit of hemlock for his trouble. And he passed on. Later, you have in introductory courses to modern philosophy, a reading from Rene Descartes. And Descartes was one who also questioned everything. He doubted everything so that he could find the one thing that he could really believe to be true. And he came up with this famous uh, dictum, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And so Descartes questioned everything and then really focused everything on himself and tried to build a world, build an understanding of things on the basis of his own rationality or personality. So Carby struggles with the relationship between the function of the philosopher and examining uh, things and trying to be doubtful of everything until you find a nugget of truth on the one hand, and then you have, as a, a Jewish person, the call to faith, to trust in the Lord. And it's very difficult for him to maintain a balance between the two. As he goes along in this essay, he reports on a story written by a, a friend of his, by the name of Hayem Badir, who talks about his father's unbelief. Though raised in an Orthodox Jewish family and trained in uh, all the laws and rituals of the Jewish faith, uh, he lost his faith in God because under the Nazi uh, regime, his brother was murdered. And he struggled with how God could allow such a thing to happen. And so he didn't believe in God. But nonetheless, he kept up the moral traditions of the Jewish faith. He observed Shabbat, Sabbath, on the seventh day of the week, and uh, tried to follow the various requirements for that. His son, which was Chaim Ba'ir, noted that his father was a little bit inconsistent in his observance of the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Uh, he would not, although he very much enjoyed uh, the uh, classical music and, and the cantons singing, uh, he would not celebrate that on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, because that violated it. But he had a neighbor, perhaps not so observant, who would play the music for him at a louder pace so he could hear it coming over from the, from the neighbor. And to reward the neighbor, the neighbor would frequent his business and he would give him a little something extra for his efforts. And so the son, Chaim, asked his father, what is this inconsistency? First, you don't believe in God, but you observe the moral laws of, of, of Judaism. Why? And then second, as you keep these moral laws, you contradict yourself by stepping into the classical world and hearing all this music from your neighbor. And Chaim was having his own struggles with belief at this point as well. Well, his father said, let's sit down and read from the Torah. 
you sit down and read from it, and it talks about what is possible on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath day. If a house is burning, what are you able to take from the house? The answer was two meals. That's it. Two meals. Because when you take those things from your house, you're going to need to survive on them for this day and the next day as well. And that was the title of his essay, Two Meals. And his idea was basically we, we kind of step in two worlds and we don't know about God anymore, but we continue at least being moral people and we kind of indulge in philosophy and unbelief and these kinds of things as well. So there is this tension within Shalom Karmi's life and towards the end of a career he's writing of this. I was curious by the, at, at this essay because of the idea of two meals. And for Carmi, it seems to me these two meals are really not very satisfying. Because it really does not bring you into relationship with God, and fellowship with Him, and belief in Him. It's rather, I don't know about God whether He's there or not, but I'll obey, and maybe in along the way as I obey, maybe God will reveal Himself to me, I don't know. And then I also got to deal with my public life as a philosopher, which questions everything. A very unsatisfying pair of meals, it seems to me. Maybe two Twinkies. <laughs> Tasty in some ways, but not very satisfying. God provides his people two meals on the sixth day of the week. As they went out during the, the week to collect the manna, they observed day after day that as they gathered enough manna for each individual person, and by the way, I didn't get to say this last week, it seems to me that the idea that the manna comes for each person gives them enough for what they need for one day, our daily bread, points us to Christ and how Christ is sufficient for us. We must have the whole Christ to satisfy us for each day. Not just a portion or not just part of him and something else as well. We feed on Christ each day. He is our bread of life. And so we draw near to him in fellowship and walk with Him by faith, and we are strengthened by union with Christ, day by day. But for the Jews, they only had enough for one day. And that kind of reminds us of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, take no worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. You know, commit your, your cares to the Lord for this day. Think about this one day. And that's what we need to do. And so that was being impressed upon Israel for five days a week. The sixth day, they had an abundance. A great amount of manna was gathered, twice what they needed. Now it seems like the leaders of the Jews were concerned about this. They were afraid that they gathered too much, that it's going to spoil and rot, just as it did for some of the folks on the first five days of the week. And so therefore they come running to Moses. Now if you go back into the previous section there, the Lord had spoken to Moses about what was to be done, but the Jews were not especially told that on the sixth day they would have double what they would need so that they could rest on the Sabbath day. So the leaders are a little bit confused here, and Moses assures them that this is what the Lord said. We've got a twice as much on the sixth day so that on the seventh day you can rest completely and eat off of that. Both meals, two meals. And furthermore, that second meal on the sixth day will be okay on the seventh day. You'll be able to eat it without it corrupt, being corrupted, spoiled. Now there's some question as to the, how that is preserved. Some think that the text here speaks of you know, what you boil, you boil, what you bake, you bake, and what's left over you keep for Sunday. And so the idea is that the boiling and the baking of the, the, the manna is what preserved the bread for the next day. Preserved the manna for the next day. Uh, 
that may be possible, it may also be possible that they eat what they eat on the sixth day, and then the man that's left over, just by God's grace, is sustained for the seventh day. So there was a continuing miracle among the people. Not only with the provision of food for each day, but now on the sixth day, going into the seventh day, they continued to be healthy as opposed to the rest of the week. Two meals then on the sixth day, so that on the seventh day, Israel could rest. Now, this is the first time, from what I'm told, and I didn't get my concordance out to check it, but this is the first time that the word Sabbath is used in Scripture. A day of rest. Now, it seems that the idea of Sabbath was uh, already current within Israel, or at least for Moses, although they may not have been observing it up until this point. When they were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh, there was no Sabbath, there was no day of rest. They might have had a, a rest here and a rest there, but there was no regular pattern of a day of rest for Israel. And so you recall last week we saw that Israel on the one hand was comparing the Lord to Pharaoh and saying when we were under Pharaoh we had pots of meat and we had bread every morning. We had all this stuff. Later on we'll talk about leeks and garlic and all kinds of stuff. But with the Lord we're starving out here in the wilderness. But now God shows his generosity to his people by providing for them each day all that they need, twice on the sixth day, so they wouldn't have to work on the seventh day. So now God has given them a day of rest, a regular day, when the whole community rests together. Isn't that so much better than having kind of a rotating schedule where one day you're off and then the next day and so the husband's off on Tuesday, and the wife is off on Friday, and then they're working at different points during the rest of the week, including the weekends and that kind of thing. I dealt with that in retail. Um, because you, you're require, require, required to work on Sunday. I was able to uh, get out of that by my religious faith and my uh, commitments. So I did not work on Sundays on the whole. Um, but you have here God's gracious provision for his people as compared to Pharaoh and the bondage that Pharaoh provided. And so if we have a situation where everyone, the whole community, is off on one day, that's an opportunity for families to be together, spend time together, and talk. It's a great opportunity now in this new covenant age for God's people to gather together all on one day to worship the Lord not have some out working uh, or uh, taking part in sports, as I've seen here in our local community. I remember driving here years ago uh, with my parents from their home in Hatboro and coming up and seeing the sports fields filled with kids running around playing soccer and baseball and things like that on a Sunday morning when they should be going to church. There's this new idol in the world today of sports and thinking that that is the way to life, joy, and salvation. In any case, God provides for his people a day of rest, a Shabbat. Now the quality of this day of rest is not simply a ceasing of all activity, although there, there's a good deal of that. You note that um, Israel was to stay at home, they were not to go out into the fields and look for the manna. They were not, in other words, to labor at that which provided them with bread. They were to put those uh, requirements to the side on the Sabbath day. They were to rest. They were even to stay in their homes or in their place at that time. I'm not sure if that meant that they had like a, a tent for each family or uh, something to that effect that they stayed together or just simply that the whole congregation was to stay where they were at and not go outside the congregation, out into the fields, or out into the wilderness to find more manna. In any case, they were to rest and to stay at home. And so God 
provides his people with rest. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It has a healing feature to it. It's given to us for our benefit, for our well-being. Uh, after laboring hard through the week, it's great to be able to relax, put these other activities to the side, and focus on other things. But Moses says more. He says it is to be a, a holy Sabbath, a, a, a day to the Lord, a Sabbath to the Lord. And while you don't have a full-blown description of all that takes place on the Sabbath here, that's going to continue to come as we go on even into the New Testament, uh, you do note that the day is holy. And you're reminded of how holiness marked the presence of God among His people. Moses, when he went on the mountain at the very beginning in Exodus 3, approached the burning bush and he was told to take off the sandals from his feet, for the ground on which he was standing was holy ground. It was holy, not because of that particular bush or that location, but because of the presence of the Lord there. And so the Sabbath is a place where God dwells with his people. A place where God reveals himself in a unique way to his people. It's a Sabbath. I think of the... Uh, Words of Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 58, verse 13, where he urges the people of his day, as we uh, read from that at the call to worship this morning, uh, you can read it in your bulletin there, where uh, Isaiah says that if you turn your foot from the Sabbath and call my day of delight the holy of the Lord, and that idea of turning your foot from the Sabbath doesn't mean you, you don't observe the Sabbath, what it means is that uh, the Sabbath is a holy day. And rather than profaning the day by just trampling over it like any other day of the week, without any regard for it being a different day, uh, no, Isaiah urged the Israelites to stop. Stop just trampling the Sabbath. Observe it as a unique and holy day to the Lord. And as you do so, you will delight in the Lord. He will make you to ride on the heights of the earth. He will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. Uh, all uh, symbols of God's blessing, his spiritual blessings on his people as they draw near to him on the Sabbath day. So, God gives his people the Sabbath and they are to observe it and it's not something that's entirely new, it seems to me, because you have the Sabbath given at the creation. And then, uh, shortly, God will reveal the Sabbath at Mount Sinai as part of the Ten Commandments. It is to be a day of rest. So, you have this old covenant situation where God's people were to set aside the seventh day to worship the Lord. It was to be a holy day where the presence of God was evident to the people of God. When we come into the New Testament, the question becomes, does this Sabbath, this Old Testament observance, continue into the church in the New Covenant age? And some will question that. They'll say, well, first of all, you have the Jewish observance of the Sabbath ongoing in the midst of the establishment of the Christian church. And Paul would go into the Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath and reason from the scriptures with the, the folks there. But then he would have a separate day, the Lord's Day, for the church. And the church would gather on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And so therefore the thought is that, well, the Lord's Day is different from the Jewish Sabbath. And the Jewish Sabbath was a part of the Old Covenant types and symbols and shadows and things that are passing away. And in the New Covenant age, we have something called the Lord's Day. And it's a day when Christians gather together, they hear the Word of God, they have fellowship with each other. But it's not quite the same as the Old Covenant Sabbath. And then, now, mind you, this was a, a view of Calvin leading on into the, the 
uh, Dutch Reformed tradition, what's called the continental view of the Sabbath. And you might even then go to Colossians chapter 2, where Paul urges the church there not to allow themselves to be bound by such requirements as to uh, observe uh, uh, restrictions against food and drink, uh, to observe uh, festival days, religious festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. So in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, you're not to be bound by Sabbaths. And so is he saying, therefore, that the Lord's Day is not a Christian Sabbath, that there's not this transfer of the Sabbath under the old covenant to the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, for the church? Well, certainly, the, the Christian church was not required to observe the Jewish Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Those Sabbaths, indeed, come to a close. They are fulfilled with the coming of Christ. But what is more, when you look at particularly Colossians chapter 2, where Paul talks about various rituals that we are not to have ourselves bound to, you'll note that the Sabbaths here come in the context of ceremonial aspects of the Jewish law, of the law of Moses. Dietary laws, what we were to eat and drink. Uh, special festivals, you recall in Leviticus 23, there are several, three or four festivals that the, the Jews were to assemble in Jerusalem, eventually in Jerusalem, and that was to be a special Sabbath. Uh, the Day of Atonement was a Sabbath, even though it might not fall on the seventh day of the week, it nonetheless would be a Sabbath day. And so there were various Rituals under the Old Testament that were part of the ceremonial aspects of the law, and they themselves would indeed fall away. And so it seems to me that what Paul is talking about there, when he references Sabbaths in Colossians 2, is not the Sabbath of the moral law given in the Ten Commandments, which after all was grounded in the creation account, and the moral order that God placed upon all of creation to imitate Him in working six days and resting on the seventh. But the, the Sabbath that Paul speaks of are these ritual, ceremonial types of Sabbaths that the Jews were requiring, Jewish believers might have been requiring observance of in order to be a good, faithful believer, along with other rituals that they insisted on, like circumcision. And further evidence for that is found in the next verse where Paul talks about these things and describes all of them as shadows of the greatest things to come. And so Paul describes the, the new moons, the, the religious festivals, and the Sabbaths as shadows of the greater things to come in Christ. And this term shadow, again, speaks of the ceremonial aspects of the law of God. We don't speak of the Ten Commandments as a shadow of the good things to come, as though the Ten Commandments passed away. We recognize that idolatry is evil for all of mankind, for all time. Uh, adultery, murder, theft, false witness, all these things are evil for all people, for all time. That's God's moral law. So also the Sabbath is required of all people for all time. But it does undergo a change of day from the seventh to the first day in view of the fulfillment of our salvation and the resurrection of Christ and the new age, the new creation that he's bringing about. And so within the uh, Presbyterian tradition, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the, the old uh, tradition coming from the Westminster Standards, uh, which was uh, about 100 years after Calvin, um, the uh, Church has recognized that the Lord's Day is a Christian Sabbath, a day of rest. Now, that's a day for worship, as our Confession and larger catechism especially details a day of worship to be given over to the worship of the Lord. 
Uh, it's a day of rest from other employments, even recreations are to be put aside. And it's a day when we are to enjoy the Lord, have fellowship with Him. And it's a day when acts of necessity and mercy may also be pursued. Jesus walking through the grain fields, and the disciples pick the grains. The Pharisees say, what are you, your disciples doing? They're working. And Jesus says, no, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. David went into the, the temple and ate of the, the food there, though it was restricted against him. And God blessed him. There are provisions for uh, things that can and should be done on the Sabbath day. But the day is to be set aside for the Lord. And so Moses uh, explains to the elders that the two meals are to be set aside, one for the Sabbath day, and they are to rest. And then the manna was to be placed into a jar and held as a testimony for the generations to come. Now Moses is going to say that God provided for his people through the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings until the time they enter into the land of Canaan. Then they will eat off the land there and no longer be required to eat off of the, the, the manna from the wilderness. So it was a temporary thing to sustain them in this wilderness wanderings. The New Testament describes our Christian experience as a time of being in the wilderness. We are wandering in this period of time and God's provision for us in Christ is sufficient for each day right through the end of our experience in this world. Until we finally enter into Canaan, new heavens and new earth, where God's blessings will go far beyond what we experience here. We have the blessings of heaven now, but not yet, not in their fullness. And so this memorial was to be placed aside as a witness or a testimony to Israel for generations to come of how God's provided for his people. And this manna, two quarts of manna, would last not only for the sixth day and the seventh day, but for year after year after year as a testimony to Israel of God's faithfulness and his provision for his people. We can look at that and know that God provides for us. First, as Jesus reminds the disciples in Matthew 6, uh, God, God knows what we need, will provide us with our food, drink, and clothing, our shelter. He provides us with these things as we seek first his kingdom and righteousness. And so we trust in him to provide for these earthly things. We pray for our daily bread. And that's for real physical food, because we need something to eat. But ultimately, God's provision for us is in Christ and the salvation in Him, the blessings of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, the righteousness of Christ, peace with God, everlasting life, the joy of the Holy Spirit's presence, the communion with God, prayers to God, all these things are ours in Christ. And they sustain us in this life until we finally enter into glory, into the eternal Sabbath. And all this because in a house, in a, in a place called Bethlehem, which means house of bread, the bread of life appeared and has come to feed us so that we might live forever. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts. We pray that the testimony of your provision for your people in Christ would be a comfort and an encouragement to us in our days of stress and trial as well as comfort and joy. We pray that you would help us evermore to rest in Christ and to be joined to him. We pray in his name. Amen.
providing for us our daily bread. And we pray that as we have enjoyed communion with you this morning, that your blessing would be on us. We pray that you bless these offerings and use them to your glory and praise. Bless your work in this place and around the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing and ripple for your service. Let's sing God rest, ye merry gentlemen, to eleven.